Relays are used extensively in telephone switching systems. All of our switches in the museum use them in one way or another. And for many years before the transistor, they were one of the basic building blocks of logic and computation circuits. As someone who works with them all the time, I take relays for granted, but they're actually really clever little devices. And they're kind of mysterious to a lot of people who live in the 21st century. So I thought we could talk about them a little bit. I'll show you how they work and how they're used in some basic circuits. The simplest way to understand a relay is as an electrically controlled switch. It's really no different from a light switch, except that where a light switch is turned on and off by your finger, the relay is operated electrically. If I wire up this relay here to close a circuit to this lamp, and then I give the relay some power, it will operate and turn on the lamp. There are a bunch of different kinds of relays. This is a modern one you can get for five bucks off the Terrible Smile website. The relay itself is just this blue plastic box on this PCB with some connections on either end here. The mechanical bits inside are hidden away and it feels sort of mysterious. It's totally possible to just hook this up and make it click without knowing much about what's happening inside. These are some relays used in telephone systems. Some of them are general purpose and others are for special applications. There's many different kinds and they all have varying characteristics that make them unique in one way or another. This one here was damaged, so I took it apart to show you how it works. This part is the core, which is made of some magnetizable metal. And wrapped around the core is a coil of wire. If we apply a current to the coil of wire, the core becomes magnetized. And now any piece of metal nearby will be attracted to the core. This is really good for us because there just so happens to be a piece of metal very nearby called the armature. The armature is hinged at the back of the relay here. And when the core is magnetized, it flexes on this hinge and is pulled into contact with the core. But just moving the armature back and forth is not quite enough to make the relay do something useful. Also attached to the relay's frame are these long springs. The springs are electrically insulated from one another at the back, so the only way for them to close a circuit is with these little contacts on the front here. So if we could find a way to push these springs together, we could close a circuit with our little relay. And that's exactly what the armature does. As the armature is magnetically pulled towards the end of the core, called the pole piece, it pushes the contact springs with it, opening or closing other circuits that are attached to the relay. Relays can have many different types of contact arrangements to allow them to do different kinds of jobs. You may have heard of normally open or normally closed contacts before. These are just what they sound like. They specify whether the contacts are open or closed when the relay is normal or not operated. In the world of telephone switching, we reverse the naming and talk about what the contacts do when the relay is operated instead of normal. Normally open contacts are called make contacts because they make a connection when the relay is operated. Normally closed contacts are called break contacts because they break a connection when the relay is operated. So I could say something like, the lamp turns on through the make contact of this relay, which just means that when the relay is operated, contacts close, which light the lamp. Another type of contact arrangement you often see on relays is called a transfer contact. In modern terminology, this is known as a DPST or double pole single throw contact. This involves three springs where the middle one moves between the two outer ones, breaking one circuit and making another. Relays are pretty old technology, dating back to the 1800s. They were originally used to relay distant telegraph signals that could not propagate over long lines. Some old-timey nerds figured out that if a signal couldn't make it all the way from here to there, you could put one of these things in the middle of the circuit where the signal is stronger. The relay operated 
when a signal was present and then relayed or retransmitted a stronger version of the signal to the recipient. You could use as many relays in the circuit as you needed, and by doing so, you could transmit signals over long distances. Over the course of many years, this concept evolved from simply repeating distant signals to more complex circuits that could light a lamp or open and close other circuits when certain things happen. In disciplines like telephony and railway signaling, relay circuits were designed with almost maddening complexity. Now that we've seen what one relay can do, let's talk about how we can combine them to do more complicated things. A great way to start would be to build a basic logic circuit. Fortunately, there's a really good book on switching circuit design called The Design of Switching Circuits by Keister, Washburn, and Ritchie. If you know Dennis Ritchie, this is his dad, Alistair, who was the co-author of this book. This book is a great crash course in relay logic, and it's helped me a lot. We can use this basic diagram on page 38 to get started. The rectangles here represent the relay coils. If we apply current to the coils, they'll become magnetized and the relay will operate. These here are the relay contacts. They're shown in their normal or unoperated configuration. When relay A operates, it will pull its contact towards the core and create a path from ground through the winding of relay R to ground, causing R to operate. In the same way, if B and C operate, then they will close a path to ground to operate R. Logically, we could express this as if A or B and C, then R. And any time R operates, the lamp will light. When we wire relays in the telephone system, we generally follow certain conventions. One such convention is that we attach battery or 48 volts directly to one side of the winding of every relay. Then to operate the relay, we provide ground on the other side of that relay's winding. Here, I've just daisy chained battery to each relay rather than running an individual power wire to each one. As an aside, you'll often hear me using the term battery when referring to telephone circuits. I don't say a battery or the battery, just battery. That's the word we use to refer to the 48 volt power supply from the batteries in the basement. All of this equipment runs on this supply, and it's understood that when someone says battery, that's what they're referring to. Anyway, I've wired these relays up into the circuit we just described, A or B and C. If those conditions are met, then the lamp will turn on. Great, now we'll do B, then C, As you might imagine, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We can make circuits of any type or complexity we want if we have enough relays with the correct contact configurations. A slightly more complex example is a counting circuit, which are used frequently in telephone work. In order to count pulses, we will need enough relays to uniquely identify each possible quantity of pulses up to the maximum number we want to count. I should mention that we can cost optimize for fewer relays at the expense of making our circuit a bit more complex, and we can introduce other things like error correction as well, but for now, let's just keep it simple. Let's start with a set of relays that counts a single pulse. In order to do that, we have to recognize three conditions. The pre-pulse condition, that is, when everything's normal. The rising edge of the pulse, that is, when I press the button and then the falling edge of the pulse when I release the button. To do that, we'll need two counting relays, X and Y, plus a third relay, P, to operate whenever I send a pulse and release when I turn off the pulse. In its normal configuration, the brake contacts of P are grounded, but that has no effect whatsoever because the circuit is open at the contacts of relay X. When we send the first pulse, 
P operates, closing ground to operate X. This pulls in the two make contacts of X. The first make contact causes X to lock to its own ground. The second contact closes the path to Y. But Y will not operate yet because I'm still pushing that button down, which means that P is still in its operated state. When I release the button, P will come down, closing ground through its back contact. This ground path is now completed through relay X, which operates Y. Y again locks up through its own break contact. Lamp turn on. We can actually optimize this circuit quite a bit. If I rewire the relays like this, we'll get the same result and can even use one fewer relay in the process. When I send a ground pulse to these two relays, X will operate from battery through its winding, closing a ground to lock itself up through the winding of relay Y. Relay Y is now set up to register the falling edge of the pulse, but Y can't operate while I have my finger on the button since the pulse is still active and there's ground on both sides of its winding. But when I release the button, battery will flow through the windings of X to the winding of Y to ground on the contact of X, which operates Y. We call this behavior shunting down a relay. That is, a relay is released or prevented from operating by placing a ground, or battery, on both sides of the winding. The neat thing about these kinds of circuits is that they can be copy-pasted as many times as we need to create a chain of relays that counts many pulses. For example, to count to 10 pulses, you use 10 pairs of relays in a row. Relay circuit design is really kind of a lost art, and some circuits are quite intricate and beautiful. The simple examples we discussed here are rarely used in these forms in actual telephone circuits. Many years of research and development has evolved them into complex yet robust circuits that not only do their job, but incorporate error checking as well. In the next video, we'll talk about some different telephone relays and what they're used for, and we'll show you some of the tools we use to actually work on the relays here in the museum. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to our channel. Thanks, and see you soon. Video's rolling. Hail Satan. Sail Hayden. Audio's rolling, also Hail Satan. And... Yeah. Okay, one more time. Lamp turn on. We can actually optimize this circuit quite a bit. It's back at 25 speed, so the part I'm reading is already off the screen. I'm going to make it up as I go along using the same cadence that I always use, but it's going to be weird because it's not going to be the script in the video.